We're in class number 27 here in our series on what the scriptures talk about and say about the Antichrist. I, my endeavor here at this particular series was just to make us a bit more familiar with um, this individual. There's a lot said about him. We had taken up all about the um, hypostatic union, the God-man, the unique person of the universe, the God-man, 100% God, 100% man. And we took that up and uh, it was uh, it helped us to understand uh, who we have in Christ. And uh, But I thought we'd flip around the coin on the other side and saw or, or have a look at Satan's uh, aspirations and desires to bring forth a child as well um, with the endeavor of taking over the world and using him to um, control everything. We went over to the book of Daniel and we looked at um, uh, the times of the Gentiles is actually what Jesus talked about. This period of time where the Gentile world would prevail as opposed to Israel who take a back seat. Um, and we took up the, the several different empires that existed in world history. The Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, oh, sorry, the Egyptian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. Start again. The Egyptian Empire, the Assyrian Empire, the medo the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, the Roman Empire, and what we're going to see is the revised Roman Empire. We talked about how all of them uh, thought that they were the be-all and end-all and that they were all going to exist forever, and they didn't. And this individual's kingdom will not be the same either. It will not last forever. It only has a period of seven years, of which three and a half he will be in total control. We talked about this individual over from the book of Daniel, and we talked about other aspects about his character and how charismatic this individual is going to be. We talked about his intellectual genius, his oratory skills. We talked about his political abilities. We talked about his business genius. We talked about his military uh, strategy. We talked about him lobbying, his governmental genius, and his religious uh, appeasement of all religions, and so on and so forth. This guy is a genius. This guy is brilliant at what he does. Um, he can destroy wonderfully, and we talked about that, and how that, you know, a lot of people do a lot of things wonderfully. This guy destroys wonderfully. He's brilliant at it. Um, and, and, you know, he comes in peaceably and, and rises up and, and takes control. And he will endeavor to do that in this seven-year period. Uh, but for him to be revealed or for him to manifest himself, there is an obstruction to this. Um, and the obstruction to his manifestation uh, or his revelation or the revelation of who he is, is the church. Uh, while we're here, he won't be revealed. A lot of times church people are running around trying to, you know, uh, work out who this individual is. Uh, the scriptures say he won't be revealed until we're gone. Yes, sir. No, and, and that's more the political aspect of it, business type of it. But he can do it, he's an orator. He's a, he'll tell you what you need to hear. But he will, um, there'll be an ecumenical gathering of religion uh, that will, because the, the beast is going to, the beast is going to run, his sidekick is going to do lying signs and wonders. And so, um, and it's also going to appear that this guy is killed and, and comes back to life. In, in, in Revelation chapter 13. So this guy is all the hallmarks of being, you know, a divine individual in that he died, was assassinated, and he recovered, and he's got a, a false prophet running around doing mighty signs of wonders around him, saying, worship him, worship him. And all the religions of the world will start to come together. And, and the, the Bible describes all of that coming together in chapters 17 and 18, uh, of Babylon, the whore. Babylon uh, being religion and they all come and worship at her feet and she pulls them all in together and then he'll come around and destroy her. But she's sort of the common denominator. She's the whore that sl slept with the world, so to speak. Uh, she has her uh, connection everywhere, uh, religiously. So if it's not Catholic or Protestant or, or Mormon or Jehovah's Witness or this one or that one, all religions uh, the, the, the Bible says here that Babylon uh, has this uh, ability to attract them all. Uh, and so uh, this ecumenical... Uh, uh, will he also be attracting the 
prophet. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. They're waiting on a prophet. This prophet's going to come and tell them all to worship the beast. Absolutely. Yeah. And doing signs and wonders to back up. Lying signs and wonders. Um, so, yeah, this guy is it's, it's going to be... Jesus made the statement in John 5. He says, I come in my Father's name and, and you won't receive me. But there's another coming in his own name. You will receive him. Uh, so, you know, the Jews will accept him. He's going to be a Jew. The Jews will accept him uh, because he's going to have all the hallmarks of what the Christ, they think, looks like, should sound like, should do, should be. But he's anti-Christ. He's against what, who, who and what Jesus is as, as God in flesh. Um, but they'll fall for him. And so he's Syrian, he's Jewish, um, and, uh, and he's a genius. So we talked about that. But we started last week uh, to talk about the extraction of the church because that's what's hindering his revelation. That's what's hindering his uh, reveal. And so um, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God says, For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So whatever God's going to do to judge this error, we're not, we not subject to that. Jesus bore our judgment in his death, burial, and resurrection, and we don't suffer that. We're not earmarked for judgment. And so when God comes to judge the earth, which the seven-year uh, tribulation and great tribulation period is, we won't be here for it, because, again, we're not appointed to the wrath of God. And much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we've already been delivered from this this period of judgment that, that this guy and the world uh, who have rejected the grace of Christ in, in the church uh, mission as we go to all the world and preach the gospel, uh, um, when, when the church is extracted from here, they'll face this wrath. We won't. Uh, and then we talked about how that when Jesus spoke about this particular time uh, and what would happen and the, the judgment of it and woe on to you that you know are still here at that time, he made this, this statement. He says, Watch therefore and pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape, not some of these things, all of these things. So he gives them a description of the tribulation and great tribulation period. He said, But you know what, guys? You just need to be aware that you can pray and avoid all of this. And the, the way to avoid it is to be a member of the church, to be born again of the Spirit of God. And so we started to talk about the extraction of the church. Last week we talked about uh, this mystery that Paul talked about, how that we would all be changed in a moment in the uh, tomo, in the twinkling of an eye, how that um, in First Thessalonians chapter 4, uh, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant uh, and concerned, especially those who have already preceded us and fallen asleep in the Lord. But the Lord will return someday to collect the, the, the bodies of the righteous dead, and we who are alive and remain at that moment will be changed, transformed, in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we'll transform from this physical body to a glorified body. And as John said, when he appears, uh, we, we, we're not quite sure what he looks like, but when he does appear, we'll be like him too. And so we get this glorified body. And again, it's not subject to, um, it's not subject to natural rules. Uh, and Jesus proved that in his resurrection body by the things that he did and uh, ultimately his ascension. There are all sorts of different uh, images that people have of what that will look like or when that will happen. Uh, I, I'm not saying that we won't be aware that we're in that season. We won't be aware that the world around us is getting more evil, more corrupt, or can easily fall into the, the trap of this guy's um, genius, um, or that they might look for a guy just like him to answer the world's problems. Again, remember, he's going to be a guy that can answer hard questions. He, he can come up with solutions to things that people never had solutions for. He can answer difficult things, um, solve problems, cures for cancer maybe. Who knows what the guy will do? But everybody's going to be duped by him. He's, he's going to be very convincing. He's actually not called ally. His terminology in the book of Thessalonians is he's called the lie. It's a noun. It's his name. He's, he's called not a delusion. He's called the delusion. It's, this is it. This is the personification of everything that is counterfeit. And he's brilliant at it. So, you know, the best lie is always the one that's closest to the, tr the truth. And this guy is going to be good. But I, I, until this extraction happens, he cannot 
be revealed. He cannot be exposed. And over here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, we read this portion of Scripture last week and we sort of hung around this for a wee bit and it's, it sort of delayed us. But let me uh, remind you again. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul had written in chapter 4, verse 13, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning those which are asleep, uh, as, to the, as that you would sorrow like others which have no hope. And then he goes on to explain, but we all will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye with the trump of God and the, and the voice of the archangel, and we should all be caught up to meet the Lord where? In the earth. Why in the air? He down if he comes down on the earth, second, second advent. And so it's not the second advent, it's a prelude to it. Uh, you know, I talked about how that there's a coming for the saints and there's a coming with the saints. When you talk about the second advent, you'll see that the church or the saints are with him. So obviously, if they're with him at his second coming, he obviously had to come and extract them before that and, and glorify them before that. And, and so Paul writes a letter then, 2 Thessalonians, to the same church later on uh, because they're under the fear that they might have missed that event, that the coming of the Lord and meeting the Lord in the air. And some had said they got a revelation. Others had said the Spirit of God told them and they had heard it elsewhere. And then others even said, well, Paul wrote it in a letter. And Paul rewrites a letter to them here and says, now, I didn't do that. And I do not want you to be scared or worried that you have missed that event uh, and that the, rap or that the Antichrist is about to be revealed or take over. He says, that didn't happen. And so, so. Of this? Yep. We're going to get to it now in a second. But you go ahead and read it. What, tell sure. me what you're asking. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself to everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Mm -hmm. Oh, are we going to you just read it or are you ask me a question? Well, my All right. I'm that correctly. No, you're not. But I'll, 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 I'll reread it for you because we're going to go on to that right now. So, so good point. Because uh, if you read it, and if you read it out of its context uh, and start in at verse 3, uh, you have to understand what that day is that he's talking about. Right? Because uh, it says that day will not happen unless there's, uh, you, in your version, it says the rebellion. It, that's not what the word is, but it's, it's a good note to, to talk about because I'm going to try and explain that to you here. It says here in 2 Thessalonians, and this is the, the first two verses of that, and we're going to go into the third now in a second. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Now he's very specific here. He's talking about by the coming of our Lord Jesus and us being gathered to him. Okay, this is not the second advent. This is the extraction. He says, I, 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 I beseech you, brethren, concerning this topic of the Lord coming back for us and us being gathered to him. The rapture. Again, uh, the terminology for the, the, uh, the rapture um, is not in the English version, but it is in the, in the Latin Vulgate. Um, and uh, the word rapture is in there, but I'll get to that now in a second. So he says, that you be not so, so soon or soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by a letter, as from me or from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Now, the day of Christ and our gathering together onto him are two different days. It's not the same day. The day of Christ was when Christ comes back at the second advent. So he said, here's what I don't want you to be afraid of. I, I want to talk to you about our, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together onto him. And I don't want you to be shaken or troubled or upset as that the second advent is at hand, the day of Christ, when he comes back to judge the world. So he says, I want to talk to you about our extraction and not be afraid that you have missed that and that the day of judgment is next. All right, The day of wrath is coming, of God's wrath. He said, I, and so there's two days mentioned here. The, is, our, is, our extraction is in verse 1, and the second advent is in verse 2. You still with me? 
Does that make sense? All right. Now, as Mark, you read then, it says, let no man deceive you, which means there are people being deceived about this. By any means, for that day, what day? Take it in its context. Let's go back and read this again. Now, I beseech your brethren, by our gathering together on to, to him, that you be not shaken, neither troubled, nor by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter from us, that that day of Christ is at hand. What's the day of Christ? Second, Second Advent. Okay. Then he goes on to say this. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day. Which? Second, Second coming. That day shall not come. Can't happen. Won't happen. Won't happen. Except there come a falling away first. Now, in your version, it has rebellion, and, and it's the word apostia, where we get the word apostasy from. It's only used twice in the New Testament. It's used also in, in Acts, um, where people had separated themselves from Moses. Uh, I think it's Acts 21, 21, something like that. Um, where people had separated themselves. Only two times it's, it's used um, in, in Scripture. Um, but the root for this word, uh, unfortunately, they, they use apostia to say an apostasy, a falling away, a backsliding, leaving God, turning your back on. That's not what this means. And if you take the root of this word, which is where this word comes from, it, it has nothing to do with that at all. It, not a thing. And I'll explain it to you in a second. Let me read this through and then we'll come back and, and we'll take it all in its context. Again, he, the, the subject of the, the discourse here is our gathering together onto him and the delusion or the fear that they had missed that day and that the day of Christ was upon them, the second advent. Then he says, no, that can't happen. That day, day of Christ can't happen until this, this falling away, this apostia comes first. Then, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes himself and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, proclaiming or declaring himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, First Thessalonians, when I was talking to you, I told you these things. But now you know what is withholding. What is withholding the second advent? What's withholding the second advent is this falling away first. Second advent can't happen until this falling away happens. Remember? Let no man deceive you by any means. That day, the day of the second advent, the day of Christ, can't happen except this falling away happen first. Then he goes on here to say, And now you know what is hindering that he might be revealed in this time. What's hindering him from being revealed is the falling away. Still with me. That has to happen before he can be revealed. When that happens, then he can be revealed. He goes on here to say, For the mystery of iniquity, which is again the name for the Antichrist, is already at work. For he who now let it, will let it, I'll go back to this, until he be taken out of the way. And then, then when? Then he that's withholding, when he is taken out of the way, then shall the wicked, capital W, this is his name, be revealed. He'll be revealed when? After the others are taken out of the way. When, verse uh, uh, 7, now we know what's, uh, that he's already at work, but now we know who's restraining him. The word there, let, it means restrain. Uh, only he who is restraining him will let. It's the same word. The word there, let, it is, is used twice, and the word is restrained. Oh, now we know who's restraining him. And we know that he will be restrained until he who's restraining him is extracted or taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the, war, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, the day of Christ, which can't happen until the falling away happens. Everybody with me so far? 
all got it in this context? You understand the narrative? They're all upset. He says, don't get upset. You didn't miss it. Our gathering together onto him, it still hasn't happened yet. And the day of Christ can happen until that happens. And here's the thing. This guy, until there's a falling away, this day can't can happen. So now we know what's holding this guy from being revealed. Because he's been withheld. And the one that's withholding him or restraining him will restrain him until he's taken out of the way. And when he's taken out of the way, then the other guy has got the level playing field to go for it. And he will be revealed. All with me. Well, that's, that's where we, because that's what causes a lot of confusion. Because yeah. there's a lot of people claim when they talk about that, have you just plug that in? I'm going to do it, but I didn't come in that speech. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to go in under that way. Just come around, for goodness sake. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Come on, Ryan, don't commando the whole way over there. Come on, Ryan, just do it. Bless your heart. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, the, the, you know, a lot of times when people will teach this, you know, the church is going to backslide. There's going to be big falling away from the church and we're all going to become worldly. And uh, let me just say this about the church. The, don't let the devil deceive you to think that the church is a weak entity. It's not. We go from strength to strength, from glory to glory, and the light of the righteous burns brighter and brighter. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is coming back in Ephesians 5 for a glorious church. A glorious church, without spot and wrinkle. Uh, our best days are, are waiting for us right now. Um, so if you're disappointed at the church right now, don't be, because it's about to be transformed. It's about to change. So, um, let, let me explain this whole narrative again. I'm going to show you a translation here from a linguist who is, um, speaks these languages um, uh, fluently uh, and uh, he a guy called Weist if any of you ever have have his uh, material and um, and Weist has a wonderful he just he, he he translates it as it is written in the Greek he, he'll write it exactly as it's written um, and so he'll put it in English but he'll put it in in the narrative in which it is actually written in the Greek so um, Weist, for those of you that are interested in that sort of stuff, really want to know how stuff is, is written, um, he writes it this way, and this guy called Weist does. So I'm, I'm going to read this same, what portion we just have to read from his translation, okay? So Weist writes it this way. Now, I am re requesting you, brethren, with regard to the coming and the personal presence of our Lord Jesus Christ, even our being assembled together to him. What's that assembly together to him? Okay, the extraction. Uh, and, and our assembly together to him, not soon to become unsettled. The source of this unsettling state being your minds. Neither be thrown into confusion, either by a spirit or through a word as from us or through a letter falsely alleged to have been written by us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come and is now upon us or present. Do not begin to allow anyone to lead you astray in any way, because that day that the Lord, second advent, that day shall not come except the aforementioned departure comes first because actually the word here apostasy its root is from the verb to depart that's all it means so it says here that the aforementioned departure which is our gathering together on him comes first and the man of lawlessness is disclosed the son of perdition he who sets himself in opposition to all and exalts himself above everyone and everything that is called a god or that is an object of worship so that he seeks himself to uh, uh, seeks himself sorry in the inner sanctuary of god proclaiming himself to be deity now notice if you take it in this context he's not saying he's not talking the falling away there is not a, a backsliding of the church 
The word there actually, in, it, it literally means to depart. He says, our gathering unto him, this day of the Lord can't happen until our gathering unto him comes first, until our extraction or that departure happens. Now, the same word is, the root for the same word is used over here. In Luke 2, in verse 36, it says, and this is Anna the prophetess when Jesus was brought in as an infant into the temple uh, uh, eight days after his birth for circumcision. It says, And there was one Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asser. Uh, she was of great age and she had lived uh, with her husband seven years from her virginity and she was a widow of about four score and four years. She's 84. And, and then, anyway. It says, which departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayer night and day. Same root word. It's translated departed. In Luke 4, 13, it's many times. I'm just going to show you this root word. It keeps coming up. And when the devil had ended his temp all his temptations, this was of Jesus in the, in the wilderness, it says, he departed from him, separated himself from him, extracted himself away from him, for a season or fell back whatever which way you want to go in, in, you know when you tell somebody to, you know you tell a platoon of, or an army you know fall back just you know don't pursue just come back it says it this way in Luke 13 and verse 27 it says but he shall say I tell you I know not whence you are depart from me you workers of iniquity. This is Jesus talking about these people come saying, Lord, Lord, we did this, Lord. He said, no, 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 no. Depart from me. Uh, the root word again, uh, it means to fall away or to fall back or to separate yourself from. And that's where the root word comes from. It says here in Acts 12 and verse 10, and when they were past the first and the second war, this is where Peter has been taken out of prison by the angel, um, it says they came to an iron gate that led it on to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from Peter. He left. And he disappeared or he whatever, but the, the description of, of the action is to depart. All right? And again, this is the root word that is used uh, where we get the word apostia from, okay, or apostasy. In Acts 15, 38, it says, But Paul uh, th th uh, sorry, thought no good to take with him, uh, th or take him with him. This is where Paul and Barnabas fought over John Mark. John Mark had gone on the first missionary trip, and as soon as they left Cyprus and ended back up on the mainland, he took off back home to his mammy. And Paul never was happy with him. He said, I can't trust the guy. As soon as you get a bit of opposition, he runs home. And so now they're going on a second missionary journey, and Barnabas says, let's take Phil. And he says, let's take John Mark. And he goes, I don't want him. Don't want him. And I can't rely on him. And so he says, uh, but Paul thought uh, uh, not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. He quit. He didn't go on that first missionary journey. He bailed out. And so again, the terminology is to depart. I'll give you another one. But well, there's loads of them. So it's just a concept. Uh, it's amazing. We get to this one verse. There's two verses where it's, it's used. And we decide the church to make a whole doctrine of the church backsliding. And the whole church uh, quitting. The whole church um, becoming lukewarm with the things of God. And then we look around and say, well, you know, there's so much materialism and the internet and, and there's so much other stuff. And uh, don't kid yourself. Jesus knows how to build his church. And the gates of hell will not prevail uh, or, or, or over, override what God is doing in it. And so um, the, the church is healthy and doing well. It just needs to be uh, more glorious and more focused. Um, and what's happened in these last few years has certainly jerked the slack out of the message that we preach, teach, and uh, and and live out, and we've we've had to we've had to fix ourselves, and we're in that process of uh, reforming the church back to the zeal that it, it needs to have. So he says here in Second Thessalonians two nineteen. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. 
that the Lord knows them that are his. So let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart. Withdraw yourself. Fall away from, come back from iniquity. It's all that it means. Now the Spirit speaketh expressively that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. This is the other uh, terminology that they use. They normally use these two. First Thessalonians, sorry, Second Thessalonians chapter 1. They say, well, the departure has to happen first. There's an apostia. There's a, there's a, um, a, a falling away of, of the church. This, this is the other rendering of the word apostia here. And notice this time it's translated depart. The other time it's, it's a falling away. This time it's depart. And so it says here, and, and a lot of times people grab this and say, well, there you go. You know, there has to be a backsliding of the church, a, a, a degeneration of our zeal, and, we, you know, we're neither hot nor cold. You know, we've lost our first love, and <sighs> the church is awesome. It's an awesome body of believers, and God's wonderfully and mightily operating through it. And... Um, and we haven't reached our finest hour yet, but we're, on, we're, we're, we're heading that direction. But he says, Now the Spirit, Holy Spirit, speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from meats, which God had created to be received with thanksgiving, of them which believe and know the truth. Again, this departing, the Spirit of God is talking about how that there's going to be a lot of false doctrine in the day in which we live. And a lot of people will depart from faith in God. It, it's, it's not, a, you know, the idea of, you know, not marrying or thinking that vegetarianism is, you know, holier than, you know, eating steak and chips or something like that. And and we get all sorts of... So this departing from the faith, it's a, it's a one-off verse, but they put this particular verse over with um, the falling away to come to the conclusion that the church is just going to apostatize away from the, the zeal and the purpose and the plan of God. That's not true. That, that's not a doctrine. Um, will people depart from the faith? Yes, I dare say that there's going to be a lot of um, other things to be entertained with in life. However... Um, I still think that the move of God is, is potent and growing and the church is expanding and abounding and God is moving and we're awake to where we're at and what's going on. So um, it doesn't say that the church are going to backslide. And this has happened before the extraction? Yes. Yeah, yeah this all happens. So let me, let me uh, uh, again, there's all sorts of pictures of this sort of stuff. People's imagination is that what's going to happen? What's it going to be like? No idea. None. It's a blink of an eye, so you're not going to see that. I don't think you'd see that that way. I don't think you'd be able to snap it. So, um, here's the deal. When it happens, uh, and you don't have to have faith for it, uh, because it's not based on my timing or your belief or my belief. It's based on God's timing and it's a thing that he does to his church. It's our gathering together on him where he comes back with a trumpet, with a shout, and the dead in Christ rise first, and we're extracted. We depart from here and gather ourselves to him. And you don't have a say in it, by the way. And you think, well, well, I don't know, I hear the I don't know if I want to go, I'm not ready yet, I'm not ready. You know, I was just about to, Collect my lotto winnings. No, 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 you're, you're done. It's out. When that's over, it's over. And so it says it this way. And here's the, the, the terminology. It says, um, Then they which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Caught up. The, the word, the verb there means to be extracted. It's, it's not, you're not asked. You know, it's not anybody ready. Hands up, who's ready? It, that's not the way it happens. It, it's we're forced. It's we're forcibly taken. We're we're caught out. We're snatched away. And so it says here, 
We are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. This term caught up, this action, is not an action on your behalf or mine. It's an action on the Lord's behalf and he takes us out. So when it happens, it's going to happen. And you know, people say, well, if you're in the cinema, you know, watching a James Bond movie, I mean, you know, it's, it's ungodliness. And so when that trumpet goes, I hope you're not in the cinema. I hope you're not standing in a bar somewhere where they serve alcohol because you're done. Because nobody is sitting in a bar is leaving. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, when he comes, all those that are his are out of here. Um, and this is an action on his behalf. And caught up means to be forcibly taken. Okay? Caught up. Or it says it this way in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2. Paul is talking here and he says, I know a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. Um, I, I, God knoweth. Such a man caught up to the third heaven. Paul had an out-of-body experience and he was taken to the third heaven. He didn't get on a bus to go and he didn't book a ticket for it either. God came and took him to the third heaven and it goes on to say, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth how that that man was caught up, there's that same term again, into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. So this is Paul's out of body experience. And again, he says, I, I, I didn't ask for it. I, I got taken to the third heaven. Yes, sir. Um, <coughs> There are three heavens mentioned in Scripture. There are the atmospheric heavens that are over us. So the birds fly in the heavens. Uh, the clouds are in the heavens. Um, and so that goes from the planet Earth up to your ionosphere, um, which we call the atmosphere that's around the Earth. That's called the heavens. Then beyond that is the stellar heavens, where you have the galaxies and the constellations and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, I mean, the Hubble telescope is still trying to see to the end of that, to send up that new telescope recently, which can see further than that. The Wilson, I think it is, or whatever they call it. Um, it's, it's gone up now and with an endeavor to look further out into space. Um, that's called the celestial heavens, the second heaven. And in the third heaven is where God resides. And so Paul said, I didn't get caught up, you know, into the clouds, or I didn't get caught up into you know, the nebula or um, Orion or whatever, I went beyond that. I went to where God resides, the third heaven. And that's where I met with him. And he showed me stuff and revealed things to me and then sent me back. And really, the two thirds of the New Testament are the narrative of the things God had shown him, all about the church and the body of Christ. Nobody had taught that. Uh, Without Paul's revelation of that, we wouldn't know about the body of Christ, about being seated in heavenly places. We wouldn't know about that plan of God for the church. Peter didn't know it. Peter said in his epistle, Paul is writing things I never heard of. I mean, he, I don't know where the guy's getting the stuff from, but it's scriptural. I mean, it's, it's divine. So Paul got this revelation and was at this experience where he was caught up into God's presence and God showed him things that natural man couldn't perceive himself. God had to show it to him. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, so, I, I, yeah. so there's three heavens. And he was caught up to the third one. And in Matthew eleven twelve it says, And from that day, John the Baptist, from the, from that, from the days of John the Baptist, this is Jesus speaking, until now the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. It's the same word caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It's also translated by force. So when it says he comes to catch the church away or to take the church away, the action is by force. See, it's not a voluntary thing. The terminology caught up and the terminology by force is the same word. You're taken. So the, the extraction is an event that God is sovereign. He'll decide the day, the moment, the hour, and when it happens, we're gone. It's just, it's time. Church is extracted, and when the church is extracted, the Antichrist 
will now be able to come to the fore. So oh. can we go back to Matthew 11, 12? So what does that verse mean? Um, I, the, on, from the days of John the Baptist until now, okay, the kingdom of heaven has been, uh, been preached, but now only those who want it can get it. It's here. But, so the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, meaning the kingdom of heaven is being preached? The kingdom of heaven, people who want the kingdom of heaven now have to press for it, is what it means. Oh, okay. So it doesn't come passively because he has arrived. You've got to want to want it, and you've got to go, got to go get it. And you will suffer persecution because of it, and you will suffer uh, indignation because you believe in it or desire, desire to walk that way. He said, but you've got to want it so bad that you're willing to die for it or fight for it. And those who wanted the kingdom, wanted the kingdom. Here it is, but let me tell you, it doesn't come passively. You have got to press into it. You've got to want it. That's really all he's saying. So he says, up until now, John the Baptist has preached all oh, the kingdom, the kingdom. He says, it's here. But let me tell you, the only ones that are going to get it are the ones who will violently press through the crowd and say, I want it. He says, you can have it. Come on, let's go. And you'll get a lot of opposition now that it's here. It was all talk up until now, but now that it's here, you've got to push your way into it. You're going to get opposition. Your friends are going to tell you, you know what, you were a great girl, you were a great guy, and then you went and got this religion stuff. Then you became one of them born-again people. Then you got one of them holy rollers. And, you know, you were a lovely person up until then. Why did you ever? You stopped coming out, you stopped doing this, you stopped going here, you stopped going there. I mean, come on, guys, let's, you know, get a life. It's, it's amazing how people turn. The, the, you know, you can you you can be the worst person in the world, and hey, you're one of the boys, you're one of the girls. But the minute you get Christ, now you're odd, weird, strange, and you know what happened to you? Well, I found Christ. Oh yeah, here we go. And he, sometimes you just got to press to stay in there because people will try and talk you out of it or shame you out of it. That's all he's saying. It's here, but it's not here passively. It's here, and if you want it, you got to come for it. It's, it's available, is really what he's saying. And only the ones who want it enough will, will take it. You've got to come and take it. I'm, not, I'm offering it, but you still have to come and take it. That's all he's saying. Um, like the people in places like China, that, that verse is real applicable to them today. Yeah, yeah, you've got to come and take it. They've got to want to want it. It's available, it's available. But you, you, and all the, I mean, all the persecution in Iran, their church is growing like weeds. Exactly, exactly, and they suffer for it. So here he says, <coughs> Jesus said, uh, sorry, and when therefore they perceived uh, that, or Jesus perceived that they were going to come and crown him as king, he, this is in John chapter 6, he realizes, you know, they're beginning to talk, hey, this guy is, you know, let's crown this guy king of Israel. It says, and when, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force, it's the same word, caught up, it's the same word. This is, this is a forced event. You you don't have an option in this one. You're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. It says, to make him king. He departed. Same root word to, to step away from. Uh, again, into a mountain himself alone. But this is a forcible act. Um, to the, the extraction is, uh, it's not voluntary. And when there arose a great dissension, this was against Paul in Jerusalem, and the chief captains, fearing least Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, the crowd were just going to maul him, it says, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. So again, it, 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 there's nothing um, passive about this. This is an aggressive move of the Lord to gather the church onto himself. So uh, it's, it's not a voluntary thing. And when it happens, it's, it'll be his sovereign move, and we will just succumb to it, being his property, being bought with a price, being not our own, we'll be taken out of here. And that's just the way it happens. Does that all make sense? All right. So, let's go back to the narrative again. Now, we beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering, our being us, the church, are gathering together onto him. This is that extraction. This is this event where he comes and catches us, snatches us. Uh, um, and uh, in John 10, uh, 28, where Jesus says, uh, you know, uh, 
I am the sheep of the shepherd and, and no, no one can snatch you out of my hand. That word snatch is the same word caught up as well, all right? So this is that extraction. And it says that you be soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, that the day of Christ, the second advent, is about to happen. He said, that's not true. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, the second advent, the return of the Lord to judge the world and the Antichrist and his armies at the Battle of Armageddon, that day can't happen except there come the departure, that gathering together onto him. That departure has to happen first before the Lord will return at the second advent. Or in other words, he has to come for the saints in order to come back with the saints. And so he's saying, you have to understand, you didn't miss it. The fact that you're still here. If you're a believer in Christ and you're still here, then it, it didn't happen yet. And the Antichrist can't be revealed yet. It goes on to say, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, Perdition. It says, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, or he that sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now, now you understand. Now you know why the guy hasn't popped his head above the parapet. Now you know why the guy can't do what he wants to do and jump onto the throne in the Holy of Holies, which isn't there yet, and do his thing and be who he wants to be, the, the great intellectual genius, the, the orator, the, the, the military genius, all of that stuff. He said he, doesn't, he has no opportunity to come to the fore because we, we are withholding him. This event is withholding him. So, and now you know, now you understand why you don't know who he is, why you haven't seen him yet. And now you know what withhold it that he might be revealed in this time. Now you know why he's not being revealed. Now you know why nobody knows who he is. He's afraid to stick his head above the parapet because the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You and I have the keys of the kingdom and you can bind what's bound in heaven and loose what's loosed in heaven. And so if he shows his head, any saint can bind him and shut him down and shut him up. Because our kingdom, the kingdom and the authority we have is far greater than his. So he has to wait for the church to go. Otherwise he couldn't do what he wants to do. The church would shut him down. Yes. Thank goodness that crowd are gone. In fact, let me tell you what happened. Religion, well, religion will still be here. Okay. Believers will be Believers gone. We are not a religion. We are not a religion. Christianity is a religion. We are not a religion. We are citizens of a kingdom. Anybody who is not a believer and put their trust in Jesus Christ, I don't care what denomination or what religion they go to, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you're not going. If you're not born again of the Spirit of God, regenerated in your, in your spirit, a new creature in Christ, forgiven, cleansed, washed, and accepted in the beloved, and, and indwelt by the Spirit of God, you're not going anywhere. Right. You're just a religious... Oh, no, 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 they'll still be. In fact, there's going to be a lot. I, I can imagine, I'm only imagining that the narrative after the extraction is God got rid of that crowd. They were so weird. And the truth is God just got rid of them all. We woke up one morning and they were gone. Good riddance to the whole lot of them. And now we can get on with life and do life without them because they were nothing but a goading, self-righteous, arrogant bunch of judgmental, condescending, you know, we're glad they're gone. Oh, we're so happy that now we can do what we like. Now we can, you know, there's no, way, and off they go. Falling away, rebellion, 
why why did all the different translations? It's not just a few. There's what what translation are you using? I'm looking at all. I'm looking at twenty-two dozen different translations. Of what? Of of Second Thessalonians two three. Yeah. The because Bible. the word is apostia. Is that the same word? All these ones where you showed us. No, that's the word to depart. That's the root word where apostia comes from. Oh, that was the okay. That the little right. key that you, you always have your root word. You have your root word. I and then you get derivatives from that root word. Okay. Okay. So if you look it up in the Strong's and go back, you'll find that it's made up of, apostia is made up of several words in, in, in the Greek. And the root word or the root verb is your foundational word. And then, like, you know, we have the verb to go to. And then from that, we have the word come or go. Uh, or, um, and so we have all these actions, but the root word is to go. Uh, if you understand what I'm saying, and that's the verb, and then you work, you work the adjectives and adverbs and so on and so forth from that. The root word is to depart, um, and only on those occasions is it used or mentioned as falling away. Weist does the great job of it because he puts it in its context, and he describes in its context what is really being said here, and. It, it, the word apostia has been used, but he's, he understands that that means the, an extraction or a departure from or a falling away or as it says in Acts 21, 21, if you'll read it there, it probably comes up there too, where Paul accused them of separating themselves from Moses. That's all it means. Um, Thank you. All right. So, um, so he says, now you know what's withholding this guy, that he might be revealed in his time for the mystery of iniquity and again this mystery again is nobody knows and if you're in the gang you'll know but at this moment in time nobody knows who this character there are people who probably do know who he is but we don't it's, it's not been revealed yet you can surmise and conclude all you want you might think well this is such an evil person it has to be him because we know that the Antichrist is going to do very evil things. And yet the Bible says for the first three and a half years, the guy is going to be smooth talker. And he, the Bible says his words are going to be like honey, a, a butter in your mouth. And this guy is going to have some skill sets that is going to make everybody think that he is the guy. And so he's not going to come in with arrogance and, and whatever. But when he does destroy you, and if you get on the wrong side of him, He'll take you out, um, but he'll do it in a manner that is, he's an expert at it. You just don't want to get on the wrong side of him. So, it says, so now this mystery of iniquity doth already work. And what he means is that spirit of opposing everything that is Christ is already in the world. There's a lot of people opposing Christ. So this antichrist spirit is already at work in the world. So don't be waiting for him to show up to, to see his work in the world. That, that anti-against God, that Jesus is God in flesh, that's already at work in the world. He said, the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now restrains. The word there, let it, is also, if you go to the, the, the Greek of that, is the word restrain. It means to you know, hold. You see somebody restraining somebody, uh, you know, that... You see two guys, you know, having a, an argument on the street, and, and you see people grabbing both of them and pulling them back and restraining them from from the action they're about to. He said, "Well, this guy would love to step in, but he can't. He's being restrained at the moment. He can't do it. He's not allowed to do it. He's not able to do it. He's being restrained." He says, "So, and now, only, sorry, now, now we know the mystery of iniquity is already at work. Only he that restrains." will restrain that's the same word only he that let him will let only he that restrains will continue to restrain him until he be taken out of the way now when we talk about this when we mention this particular verse of scripture a lot of people come to the conclusion that the he that's been taken out of the way here is the holy spirit a lot of people come to this conclusion that the Antichrist can't come expose and reveal himself until the Holy Ghost is taken out of the way. That's not true. That can happen. Let me say something first. The Holy Ghost has been here long before we ever showed up. 
you go back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, the Bible says, And the Spirit of God brooded over the waters of the earth. He was already here. If you go to the last few verses in the book of Revelation, it says, And the Spirit of God says, Come, whosoever will let him come. Also, the Bible says that the job of the Holy Ghost is to bring conviction. It says in John chapter 6, Jesus speaking, says, No man can come to me unless the Holy Ghost draw him. You have to have the Spirit of God. Conviction comes from the Spirit of God. He's here to convict the world of sin in John 14, John 16. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. If you take the Holy Spirit away from the earth, nobody can get born again or believe on the message of Christ after the rapture of the church. If you take the Holy Ghost away, you can't have a revelation of Christ anymore because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 that the things of God can only be revealed by the Spirit of God for the things of the Spirit cannot be understood by the natural man. You have to have the Spirit of God to understand this stuff. So the He is not the Spirit of God here. The He here is the church. The church. Now this again is where they all get confused. Because people automatically say the church is where the Holy Spirit is housed. Go further than that. The bride of Christ. We're the bride of Christ. We're not. At this moment in time. We will not be the bride of Christ until after the rapture of the church. After the rapture of the church, when we meet the Lord in the air and we go to the judgment seat, the, the, the rewards seat, the word there uh, in Corinthians and Romans is the word bema, the bema seat, which is the reward seat. Uh, and when we stand before the Lord, when we meet him in the air, we'll be rewarded for what we've done while we were down here. Wood, hand, stubble, gold, silver, precious stone. Do you know that whole story? And he says, if you end up with nothing, just a puff of smoke, hey, you're still, you're still good to go, but no reward. Nonetheless, you're still good to go. That reward seat that, that, that we, when we go to heaven as the church in our glorified bodies, we're presented to the Father without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. And that's where we see in this seven-year period, while we're in heaven for that seven-year period, on the earth is the tribulation and the great, tribula great tribulation period, but in heaven, what we're experiencing is? Is that our, our, so our bodies are going to be the going to have the marriage supper. The marriage supper of the Lamb. And the marriage supper is where the church now, who at this current moment in time are the body of Christ, we're not the bride of Christ yet. We're the body of Christ. See, we do this all the time. We keep mis mixing up our doctrines all the time because we read it in the scripture and then we just throw it in anywhere. Well, he is the king of kings. Not at the moment he's not. He will be the king of kings when he comes back at the second advent and he puts all kingdoms under his feet. But at this moment in time, that's not the office he holds. Although he is the king of the kingdom for us, um, his ministry for us and to us is as our high priest. Before this, he was the prophet. There's three offices in the Old Testament that typify Jesus. Three of them, what are they? Prophet, priest, and king, in that order. Those three individuals could not do what they were needed to do without the anointing of God to do it. So the prophet needed the anointing to be the prophet. And then the priest needed an anointing to be the priest. And the king needed the anointing to be the king. Jesus is the prophet, currently the priest, and the soon coming king. All with me. When he returns as the king of kings to lord over the earth, he will have with him who? The church. Which will be called? The bride. What are we now? The body. the body of Christ. We're not the bride of Christ at this moment. We will be someday. We will be and we will rule and reign with him forever at that point. At this moment, we're the extension 
of him. We are connected as the body of Christ. The body of Christ is always referred to in the male gender. Wouldn't it be strange to call Jesus her? If I'm the body of Christ, I know they're having trouble at the moment with gender fluidity, but Jesus is not having any problems with gender fluidity. Don't let the church do it either. We are the body of Christ. If he is referred to in the male gender as the body of Christ, what are we referred to? Male the male gender. All right. Ephesians 2.14. So this is... It's the church. But let me, let me show this to you here. So that, and I'll go back and read the narrative again. And Paul writes this to the church in Ephesus. For he is our peace who had made both one. For he had broken down the middle wall of partition between us. This is the Jew and the Gentile to make one new body, which is the church. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law and the command of the commandments contained in ordinances to make in himself of the two of the Jew and Gentile to make in himself of the two one new man male the body of Christ is referred to in the male gender so making peace okay Ephesians chapter 4. In verse 11 it talks about him giving apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry and so on and so forth. Then he comes down to verse 13. It says, Till we all come into the unity of the faith onto the knowledge of the Son of God onto a mature or a perfect man onto the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ and goes on to talk about the body and each member of the body supplying their part to edify and expand and extend the body itself. You still with me? The body of Christ is always referred to in a male gender. The bride of Christ is female and we are not there yet. We're still the body of Christ. We're not the bride of Christ yet. Technically we will be but we're not yet. So don't mix your doctrine up. Understand who we are, what we are, and, and operate by faith in, in our appointed, assigned uh, position as the body of Christ. I'm the extension of his words, I'm the extension of his hands, I'm the extension of his feet, I'm part of him. When he extracts us out of here, we then become, as an entity, the bride of Christ. Because he doesn't need a body in the earth anymore he doesn't need a body to work through. How many of you know you need a body to work in this earth? You need a physical body to work in this earth. Without a physical body, you are? And they work in this earth. You're dead. You need a body. Jesus, in order to work in this earth, he needs a physical. What is that body? The church. And we are referred to in the male gender because we are the body of... That's why we were referred to as the body of Christ. Because you need a body to operate through. And so his spirit in us and his ownership of us and our connectivity to him makes us the body of Christ which enables, allows and empowers him to operate on the earth today. You say, well, when he left, he left. No, he didn't. He extended himself in me, in you, through me, through you. And so we're referred to in the male gender. So, let's go back to this narrative. Let no man deceive. Let me, let me read it to you. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our extraction and our gathering unto him. Do not soon be shaken in mind or to be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by some letter as from us, saying that the second advent is at hand. You see, that day, don't let man deceive you by any means. For that day, the second advent, can't come except there come the departure. The catching away, the snatching away, taken by force. They, that, the second advent can't happen until the departure comes. 
And then the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that worshipped, or so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And so now you know. Now you know why he hasn't been revealed. Now you know why he hasn't stuck his head up the, over the parapet. Now you know who and why he's been withheld, that he might be revealed in his time. That mystery of iniquity, oh, that spirit of stuff is still working. It's still around as people opposing the real Christ. But only he who now is restraining him will continue to restrain him until the extraction, until the departure, until he is taken out of the way. The he being the body of Christ. If the 144,000 Jews that are going to preach the gospel after we're gone, they're going to need the Holy Ghost. And, and the people they preach to are going to need the Holy Ghost to get a revelation of what happened, and they're going to need the Holy Ghost for the regeneration should they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Take the Holy Ghost away from here, it does not works. It goes on to say, And then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord then will, will consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. What coming is this? second coming so until the church is extracted this guy this genius this individual this counterfeit this antichrist exists and this is his final note this is the final note about this individual so instead of running through the book of revelation and we can talk all about him and all his antics and his intellect and his cunning and his craftiness his economy his religious skills and i didn't want to get into that because that's just a whole other i just thought we'd read this about him this is the, ba the battle at the end. He had made the boldness in the statement, who can war against, who can make war against me and beat me? It says, and the beast was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which was, which, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both, and that's the beast and the false prophet, were cast alive into Gehenna or the lake burning with fire. These are the first two individuals to go into this place and they're not men because it's appointed unto man once to die and then judgment. <coughs> Human beings will stand before the white throne judgment of God and the books will be opened and they'll be judged according to whether they made Jesus Lord of their life and then the works that they did in the flesh. These two guys aren't entered in either of those books. These two guys are a hybrid and and demonic and and they go straight into the lake of fire a thousand years later their lord and master joins them satan he's the third individual into the same place but these go first so um that's that No, that's after the extraction. Between the extraction and the second advent, we go through, you'll read it in chapter 19, we go through uh, the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Okay. Um, now, we'll be, we'll be aware of all that's going on down in the earth because as we're having this marriage supper of the Lamb, the Lamb is opening scrolls and seals and and there's a lot of stuff going on down on the earth in the judgment of god upon the earth but we're not we, we we've been delivered from that judgment and when we come back you know, read in revelation 19 that jesus comes back on a white horse with a sash across his thing called lord of lords and and uh, king of kings and lord of lords and and the bible says and we accompany him on white chargers as well and dressed in linen, white and clean. And the linen that we're dressed in is the righteousness of the saints, which is the bride of Christ. And so we, we'll be with him forever as the bride of Christ. When the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, we will reside in the new Jerusalem because we will reside with him and we will rule and reign with him eternally. So the bride of Christ, the body of Christ at this moment will become the bride of Christ. We are the most unique entity ever and although the old testament saints the saints that are going to be born during the millennial reign of christ and then those that will go into the new heaven or the new earth 
Um, and they'll be natural people. Uh, none of them will be like us. The church is the most unique entity that hu humanity will ever see. For us to be in Christ is the most. And the devil has totally deluded us and watered it down to some traditional religion, candle lighting, bell ringing, moaning bunch of deluded people who don't understand who we are and what we have in Christ Jesus. That's the truth. We need to snap out of it and, and find out who we are and start being who we were meant to be. Any more questions on that? Because I'm not doing the Antichrist now for another while. On the marriage supper of the Lamb, is that, do you think that takes place the whole seven years? Because they used to have their weddings for a week? Or do you think they used to have their weddings. The, the, the traditional Jewish wedding lasted seven days. And so what they would do is, um, what Jesus in John 14 made the statement, Behold, I go to prepare a place, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go away, I will return. For in my Father's house there are many mansions. Remember that whole story? Now that's a wedding. That's an alluding to a wedding. Uh, and what would happen in those days, and what, what was understood is, that when uh, a man was betrothed to his wife, they didn't come together. They were just promised to each other, or they promised each other to each other, and their families agreed. Then, before they ever came physically together, he would go back and prepare an extension onto the house, to the home, the father's house, and make an extension on it. In some countries, they build above it, and you get another generation. If you go to Romania, they build a house, and then they build another house on top of that, and then the kids live up there, and, and they keep looking after the grandparents, and they sort of build generationally on top of one another, but they all sort of live in the same location. You find that still in cultures today. Well, in their culture, that's what they did. They built an extension onto the house, or he made a room for them. I go to prepare a place for you, that's a wedding term. And so you go to prepare a place for you, and he prepares a place, and when it's ready, then the father of the house tells the son, okay, this is good enough for her, go get her. But that decision is not made by the, the groom, that is made by the father of the groom. And that can happen any time. And so in the meanwhile, back where the virgin is, they're all waiting because he can come back any day. He, he, they don't know when he's coming back to collect her, but he is coming back because they're married, they're, they're betrothed to each other, and they're waiting for his father to tell him when he can come, when the house is ready and the room is ready, and so you don't know when he's coming. But when he does come, you be prepared to go. And if he comes in the night, then make sure you have your lantern because you don't want to miss the wedding, you know, and so he comes, and there's a shout, and there's an accolade, and, and you know, here he comes, here comes the, 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 the groom. When the groom comes, she automatically drops everything and leaves. And, and those who are invited to the feast, they go too. And they all leave, and they go back to the house, and when they go to the house, they celebrate, and then he and her go into a private quarter for seven days. Now, she hasn't lifted the veil off her face at this stage. They go in there. The only person that sees her in her glory is the groom. And that, that intimacy is there for that seven-day period. In the meantime, out in the courts, all the people invited to the, the, the wedding celebrate. That's where Jesus did the, 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 the changing of the water into wine. He came at the end of the wedding. I mean, they had several days into it, and if it was an Irish wedding, they probably drank it on the first couple of days. But anyway... Um, uh, and then when it came in the last part of the wedding, um, Jesus turned the water into wine. Um, and they said, you saved the best till last. And, and that's what they were talking about because it went on for days. And so uh, typically that was a seven-day feast or festival to go to a wedding. So it typifies the um, extraction of the church, the tribulation, great tribulation period. Um, and it, it explains the purification of the church and getting rid of any spot, wrinkle, and so on and so forth. The rewards for the wood, hay, and silver, gold, silver, precious stones uh, scenario with the beam of seat, um, the promotion, the handing out of different crowns, um, and then us being betrothed and becoming that new entity called the Bride of Christ to rule and reign with him forever. Then we have the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the second advent and everybody gets to see the bride. Here she comes. She's coming with him. And that's us, the church. And we rule and reign with him forever. 
so it totally typifies. Um, so w will it go over the seven day, the seven years? Yes, I believe it will. Um, I, I believe that that's all going to happen during that period of time. Will we know what's happening on the air? I, I don't know that we'll care. I, I don't think I'd care. Um, I think when you see him, that's all you care about. Uh, I think when you leave off of here, you'll not be interested in coming back. Um, you know, I mean, who wants to come back to this? Uh, to be with him is far better. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't care, to be honest with you. I couldn't give a. <laughs> I don't care. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Good, uh, you, you, talk, you talk, spoke earlier about <coughs> It is a what? Struggle. No, it's not a struggle. To, to further the kingdom here. You talk about it being like, uh, you know, that you got to fight for it. Like, yeah, there's a lot of opposition to entering into it. Yeah. You got to want it. You got to want it. Yeah, it. It's on offer. But it's not a, oh, I think I'll have that. No, no. And even as a believer today, it's still hard to renew your thinking and enter into that. You got to really want to enter into this thing. You got to want to renew your mind. You got to want to conform and drop some stuff to start living, thinking, and acting a completely different way. Um, yeah, and e e even, even as a believer. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. And even confronting things, like confronting evil, confronting, um, checking. The hey, the church has been confronted for the last two years on many fronts. Um, you know, and. You know, you just got to stand your ground. You, it, there's a lot of opposition, and there's going to be more opposition come uh, before we, we exit. But uh, all of that opposition and the definition and the differentiation between who we are in Christ and, and the world uh, becomes more clear as the days go by. Um, and so all that's happening uh, is oh, it's, it's going to be tough. It's, it's just going to define us better, that's all. Um, it's going to have to make, make choices. It's going to help us to stand up for who we are and what we believe we are. Um, and it may require a, a different level of commitment and faith and faithfulness than we are casually doing now. But so be it. There'll be grace for it anyway. Um, a practical example of that. I was just reading online yesterday about not, they were locked down pretty tight in Canada and they had a law that you can only have 10 people come to church at a time. And there was a church that didn't didn't abide by that, didn't agree with that, so they were meeting. So they got their church locked up. So for the last year, this church has been meeting outside in sub-zero weather when it's winter time, and they, their church has grown from 100 some members to over 400 members, and they've been meeting year-round outside mm -hmm. as a church. So yeah. they're, they're doing some of that ahead of the curve up. Yeah. yeah. It, it, the church is growing; it's abounding. And don't don't think yourself. Don't let the devil tell you that we're on the decline. It's not. Um, it's, it's on the increase um, and we're better equipped than ever. We just are going through a reformation. We're just reforming ourselves and our thinking. Um, nothing like a good fight. To, but truly, you know, they, how, will you ever, how will you ever know of greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world until he that's in the world tries to compete with the greater that's in you? You know, hey, I'm a, I'm a world champion boxer. You can say that all you want until you step into the ring with another fellow who thinks he's the world champion. Then we find out who's the world champion. I mean, how will we ever know who the church are if we're just going to ring bells, burn candles, and, you know, titillate ourselves with niceties and, you know, religious rhetoric and, and, and you know, vernacular that sounds holy and bold, but when the fight comes on, we run. And, and yet challenge to be kind and to push you in the way of, uh, it, 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 it's mindful of some stuff, I mean, mm. personally and, and in a bigger, but I, for myself, I, I actually have to control a bit of that because naturally I have that bit of a fighter and yet, mm. um, yeah, it's just the way I grew up. Yeah, but I'm not talking about that necessarily, that type of fight. I'm talking about the fight within to stand for what you believe to be true. I'm not asking you to go fist fight with everybody in the street. You're a Christian. No, boom. No, no, that's not what I'm asking. You need to be born again. No, no, that's not. Well, to confront. 
you have to be willing to stand for what you believe. Yeah. You really you do. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to store up any trouble. Yeah. That's like I joined the army, but they'll fire shots. <laughs> you know, they give me. What do you want me to do with this? <laughs> hey, they're firing at me. Well, you have a rifle and you're in the army, so they are going to fire at you. So you better start firing back. And um, and you know, you know, we we enlisted, but we don't want to fight. Yeah, but it, it's just the way it is. You know, we signed up, but we don't want to. We don't want to battle. Um, Of course. I think the greatest, the greatest office on the planet that is under a threat and is under attack is the role of the male. Uh, the role of a man, his function, his position, his foundational uh, strength and, and the role of not just the male but of the father, of the provider, of the protector, um, of all of the things that the scriptures say he is. but. A feminism will stand up and say, I can do just as good a job. Nobody said you're not intellectually smart, that you're not intellectually capable of doing some awesome things, but a man can't have a baby. He just can't. That's the woman's prerogative. Now, they'll try and mess that whole narrative around. They'll, they'll, they'll try and mess that narrative around now and they'll show you pictures of some testosterone stuff. And, you know, if you have a womb, you're a woman. So how do you know the difference? God, may, if you have a womb, you are a woman. The word woman means wombed man. If you have a womb, you are a woman. I don't care if you have another appendage connected. If you have a womb, you're a woman. I don't care if you have a beard. If you have a womb, you're a woman. If you don't have a womb, and I don't care if they've given you breast implants or you've taken hormones, I don't care. If you have no womb, you are not a woman. It is not rocket science. It is so easy to discern the difference, naturally. What problem is, if you move away from that thing and you move away from the principles, then you get all of the opinions. And, you know, that's, God already defined the principle of what and how it works. So yes, I agree. I think the male is under tremendous attack. Absolutely. What I'm saying, do you think that is Satan behind what, how it's been so blatantly attacked at this point? I think the wokeism that's in the world today is a force to be reckoned with. Um, I think our, uh, our ideal of people's opinion of us, uh, we all, nobody likes not to be liked, nobody likes to be hated. Uh, we all want to be accepted. I mean, who wants to not be? Who wants to be rejected? Who wants to be ostracized? Who wants to be isolated? Or, and, and you see that with these kids now that, you know, live life for, for, for hits on, on, on a web page or whatever, and, and, or commit suicide because they don't get enough of them or because they can't compete with them. And that's how powerful this whole wokeism is. The church need to watch out too because we're not here to please the world. We're here to please him, period. And if the world don't like us, he said, well, be of good cheer. In this world, you will have persecution, but cheer up, guys. I've overcome the world. 